Hi, I'm Rashonda Cade. Welcome to Reading with Rashonda. We are reading Clotel by William Wells Brown, and we're finishing up chapter 19, which is the chapter where Clotel escapes. So I'll backtrack just a little bit from where we were last time, and we will read on. After a quick passage, the fugitives arrived at Cincinnati, and there separated. William proceeded on his way to Canada, and Clotel again resumed her own apparel and prepared to start in search of her child. As might have been expected, the escape of those two valuable slaves created no little sensation in Vicksburg. Advertisements and messages were sent in every direction in which the fugitives were thought to have gone. It was soon, however, known that they had left the town as master and servant and many were the communications which appeared in the newspapers in which the writers thought or pretended that they had seen the slaves in their disguise. One was to the effect that they had gone off in a chaise, one as master and the other as servant, but the most probable was an account given by a correspondent of one of the southern newspapers who happened to be a passenger in the same steamer in which the slaves escaped, and which we here give. One bright starlight night in the month of December last, I found myself in the cabin of the steamer Rodolph, then lying in the port of Vicksburg and bound for Louisville. I had gone early on board in order to select a good berth, and having got tired of reading the papers, amused myself with watching the appearance of the passengers as they dropped in one after another, and I, being a believer in physiognomy, formed my own opinions of their characters. For those of you who don't know, physiognomy is a study um, of people's head shapes and personality traits based on their head shapes. The second bell rang, and as I yawningly returned, to my wa returned my watch to my pocket, my attention was attracted by the appearance of a young man who entered the cabin supported by his servant, a strapping negro. The man was bundled up in a capacious overcoat, his face was bandaged with a white handkerchief, and its expression entirely hid by a pair of enormous spectacles. There was something so mysterious and unusual about the young man as he sat restless in the corner that curiosity led me to observe him more closely. He appeared anxious to avoid notice, and before the steamer had fairly left the wharf, requested in a low, womanly voice to be shown his berth as he was an invalid and must retire early. His name he gave as Mr. Johnson. His servant was called, and he was put quietly to bed. I paced the deck until Tybee light grew dim in the distance, and then went to my berth. I awoke in the morning with the sun shining in my face. We were then just passing St. Helena. It was a mild, beautiful morning, and most of the passengers were on deck enjoying the freshness of the air and stimulating their appetites for breakfast. Mr. Johnson soon made his appearance arrayed as on the night before, and took his seat quietly upon the guard of the boat. From the better opportunity afforded by daylight, I found that he was a slight-built, apparently handsome young man with black hair and eyes, and of a darkness of a complexion that betokened Spanish extraction. Any notice from others seemed painful to him, so to satisfy my curiosity, I questioned his servant, who was standing near, and gained the following information. His master was an invalid. He had suffered for a long time under a complication of diseases that had baffled the skill of the best physicians in Mississippi. He was now suffering principally with the rheumatism, and he was scarcely able to walk or help himself in any way. He came from Vicksburg and was now on his way to Philadelphia, at which place resided his uncle, a celebrated physician, and through whose means he hoped to be restored to perfect health. This information communicated in a bold, offhand manner enlisted my sympathies for the sufferer, although it occurred to me that he walked rather too gingerly for a person afflicted with so many ailments. After thanking Clotel for the great service she had done him in bringing him out of slavery, William bade her farewell. The prejudice that exists in the free states against colored persons on account of their color is attributable solely to the influence of slavery and is but another form of slavery itself. And even the slave who escapes from the southern plantations is surprised when he reaches the north at the amount and withering influence of, his pre of this prejudice. William applied at the railway station for a ticket to the train going to Sandusky and was told that if he went by that train, he would have to ride in the luggage van. Why? asked the astonished Negro. We don't send a Jim Crow carriage but once a day, and that went this morning. The Jim Crow carriage is the one in which the blacks have to ride. Slavery is a school in which its victims learn much shrewdness, <clears throat> and William had been an apt scholar. 
Without asking any more questions, the Negro took his seat in one of the first class carriages. He was soon seen and ordered out. Afraid to remain in the town longer, he resolved to go by that train and consequently seated himself on a goods box in the luggage van. The train started at its proper time and all went on well. Just before arriving at the end of the journey, the conductor called on William for his ticket. I have none, was the reply. Well, then, you can pay your fare to me, said the officer. How much is it, asked the black man. Two dollars. What do you charge those in the passenger carriage? Two dollars. And do you charge me the same as you do those who ride in the best carriages, asked the negro. Yes, was the answer. I shan't pay it returned the man. Good for him. If you are making me ride with luggage, then I'm going to pay what the luggage pays. Mm. And uh, it was probably nothing. It's not like flying airlines today where they charge you an arm and a leg for your luggage. But I digress. You black scamp, do you think you can ride on this road without paying your fare? No, I don't want to ride for nothing. I only want to pay what's right. Well, launch out two dollars and that's right. No, I shan't. I will pay what I ought and won't pay any more. Come, come, nigger, you're fair and be done with it, said the conductor in a manner that was never used except by Americans to blacks. I won't pay you two dollars and that enough, said William. Well, as you have come all the way in the luggage van, pay me a dollar and a half and you may go. I shan't do any such thing. Don't you mean to pay for riding? Yes but I won't pay a dollar and a half for riding up here in the freight van. If you had let me come in the carriage where others ride, I would have paid you two dollars. Where were you raised? You seem to think yourself as good as white folks. I want nothing more than my rights. Well, give me a dollar and I will let you off. No, sir, I shan't do it. What do you mean to do then? Don't you wish to pay anything? Yes, sir, I want to pay you the full price. What do you mean by full price? What do you charge per hundredweight for goods? inquired the Negro with a degree of gravity that would have astonished Diogenes himself. A quarter of a dollar per hundred, answered the conductor. I weigh just 150 pounds, returned William, and will pay you three-eighths of a dollar. Do you expect that you will only pay 37 cents for your ride? This, sir, is your own price. I came in a luggage van and I'll pay for luggage. Boom! After a vain effort to get the Negro to pay more, the conductor took the 37 cents and noted in his cash book, received for 150 pounds of luggage, 37 cents. This reader is no fiction. It actually occurred in the railway above described. Thomas Corwin, a member of the American Congress, is one of the blackest white men in the United States. He was once on his way to Congress and took passage in one of the Ohio River steamers. As he came just at the dinner hour, he immediately went into the dining saloon and took his seat at the table. A gentleman with his whole party of five ladies at once left the table. Where is the captain? cried the man in an angry tone. The captain soon appeared, and it was some time before he could satisfy the old gent that Governor Corwin was not a nigger. The newspapers often have notices of mistakes made by innkeepers and others who undertake to accommodate the public, one of which we give below. So I'm going to have to pause here and say, maybe he wasn't white. Maybe he was black, passing as white, right? And I think that's why William Wells Brown is telling this story right here. We have Clotel, who is legally black, but looks white and is passing as white. And that very well could be people in Congress, people on the bus, people everywhere. Um, part of William Wells Brown point, Brown's point here is that race is fluid and we don't know who is what race do we even know what race is? Does race even mean anything? And so telling these stories of people who manipulate race reinforces that idea that race is not immutable if you can manipulate it. And if race is not immutable, the things that we ascribe to race also are not immutable. And I love that about um, this particular book and about a lot of the things I read in 19th century American lit. So I'll continue. On the 6th, 
I don't know what this abbreviation is for. I-N-S-T, maybe institution? On the sixth in institution, the Honorable Daniel Webster and family entered Edgartown on a visit for health and recreation. Arriving at the hotel without alighting from the coach, the landlord was sent to see if suitable accommodation could be had. The dignitary appearing and surveying Mr. Webster while the Honorable Senator addressed him seemed woefully to mistake the dark features of the traveler as he sat back in the corner of the carriage and to suppose him a colored man, particularly as there were two colored servants of Mr. W. outside. So he promptly declared that there was no room for him and his family and he could not be accommodated there at the same time suggesting that he might perhaps find accommodation out at some of the huts up back, to which he pointed. So deeply did the prejudice of looks possess him that he appeared not to notice that the stranger introduced himself to him as Daniel Webster, or to be so ignorant as not to have heard of such a personage. In turning away, he expressed to the driver his astonishment that he should bring black people there for him to take in. It was not till he had been repeatedly assured and made to understand that the said Daniel Webster was a real live senator of the United States that he perceived his awkward mistake and the distinguished honor which he and his house were so near missing. In most of the free states, the colored people are disfranchised on account of their color. The following scene, which we take from a newspaper in the state of Ohio, will give some idea of the extent to which this prejudice is carried. The whole of Thursday last was occupied by the Court of Common Pleas for this county in trying to find out whether one Thomas West was of the voting color, as some had very constitutional doubts as to whether his color was orthodox and whether his hair was of the official crisp. <laughs> whether his color was orthodox? My color is unorthodox and my hair is clearly not of the official crisp. Was it not a dignified business? Four profound judges, four acute lawyers, 12 grave jurors, and I don't know how many venerable witnesses, making in all about 30 men, perhaps all engaged in the profound, laborious, and illustrious business of finding out whether a man who pays tax, works on the road, and is an industrious farmer has been born according to the Republican Christian Constitution of Ohio so that he can vote. So we're talking about a person here who pays taxes, who works, who is a farmer and may not be able to vote just because that person may be black. Mm -hmm. I'm brandishing and angry. And they wisely, gravely, and judgmatically decided that he should not vote. What wisdom, what research it must have required to evolve this truth. It was left for the Court of Common Pleas for Columbian County, Ohio, in the United States of North America to find out what Solomon never dreamed of. The courts of all civilized heathen or Jewish countries never contemplated, lest the wisdom of our court should be circumvented by such men as might be named who are so near being born constitutionally that they might be taken for white by sight. I would suggest that our court be invested with smelling powers and that if a man don't exhale the constitutional smell, he shall not vote. This would be an additional security to our liberties. <laughs> oh my gosh. He's like, what? Really? This person looks white um, and is doing all the things of a citizen and you're not going to let them vote just because you aren't positive the person is white? Why don't you smell them too? Maybe that'll help. Mm. <sighs> William found, after all, the liberty in the so-called free states was more a name than a reality. That prejudice followed the colored man into every place that he might enter. The temples erected for the worship of the living God are no exception. The finest Baptist church in the city of Boston has the following paragraph in the deed that conveys its seats to pew holders. And it is a further condition of these presents that if the owner or owners of said pew shall determine hereafter to sell the same, it shall be offered in writing to the standing committee of said society for the time being at such price as might otherwise be obtained for it, and the said committee shall have the right for ten days after such offer to purchase said pew for said society at that price, first deducting therefrom all taxes and assessments on said pew then remaining unpaid." 
And if the said committee shall not so complete such purchase within said 10 days, then the pew may be sold by the owner or owners thereof after payment of all such arrears to any one respectable white person, but upon the same conditions as are contained in this instrument, an immediate notice of such sale, such sale shall be given in writing by the vendor to the treasurer of said society. Why do you have to pay for a pew in church? Oh, you can only come to my church if you can pay for a pew and we only sell pews to white people. Okay, so that's getting rid of everybody who isn't white. If you're not white, don't even bother coming to church. And if you're not white and rich enough to buy a pew for you and your family to sit in, additionally, don't bother to coming to church. Jesus is not happy with that. Mm. Such are the conditions upon which the Rose Street Baptist Church Boston disposes of its seats. The writer of this is able to put that whole congregation, minister and all, to flight by merely putting his colored face in that church. We once visited a church in New York that had a place set apart for the sons of Ham. It was a dark, dismal-looking place in one corner of the gallery, graded in front like a hen coop with a black border all around it. It had two doors. Over one was BM for black women over the uh, black men rather over the other was bw for black women and that was chapter 19 and the story of clotel's escape plus some other stories of manipulating race and prejudice and i appreciate how william wells brown loves to tell a story within a story within a story with true things mixed in with fiction newspaper articles I don't know if you've ever read The Blind Assassin by Margaret Atwood. That is a beautiful novel of stories within stories within stories. And um, our friend William Wells Brown is doing a lot of that meta sort of work as we are wrestling with what it means to be a race. Does it mean anything? And if it does, are those things important? Are they true? Are they genetic? Are they social? And these are the things that we're tackling here while we're reading Clotel. So thank you for joining me. That has been Reading with Rashonda. Until next time, thank you.